may focus on the tech side of things at Digital Foundry, but that doesn't mean there isn't a lot of game playing happening behind the scenes. Thus, this year, I wanted to put together a proper Games of the Year list, a top five to be specific. Contrary to most other videos on the site, this isn't about pushing the most impressive visuals or fastest frame rates, rather, this is all about the game experience itself. So without further ado, here's my top five games of the year. I've always admired and enjoyed the works of Yoko Taro. From his directorial debut on Drakengard and beyond, his games have always left a strong impression despite various, sometimes significant drawbacks. Which is where Nier Automata comes in and what makes it so special. It's perhaps the first game that he's directed which manages to free itself from these drawbacks almost entirely. By utilizing the expertise of Platinum Games in developing it, we're left with a perfect blend of Yoko Taro weirdness with rock-solid play mechanics. It fully overcomes the repetitive scenarios and weak mechanics of previous games by offering combat and control which can stand on its own as a dedicated hack and slash action game. What makes the experience itself so special then is the way in which so many disparate pieces are collected into one cohesive whole. This is a case where every element stands out and elevates the experience to a new level. This is made evident from the start, with the game shifting between different genres including overhead, horizontal, and dual stick shooters. Boss fights can turn into a full on bullet hell shooter while unexpected minigames can appear at any point. Throughout all this, camera angles shift regularly, setting up unique and often unexpected shots. And on top of that, traversal itself is made engaging by refined movement and animation systems while the combat feels just right. This is tied together with a rich narrative which explores themes and ideas which push the boundaries of what it means to tell a story in a game. It's great stuff. Beyond that, all of this is punctuated with one of the finest soundtracks in gaming. It's a true masterpiece. And really, it's this perfect blend of powerful music, brilliant action and unexpected plot twists which help define Nier Automata and I love it. And all of this manages to overcome its technical weaknesses. Sure, the frame rate isn't as steady as you'd like and the cutscenes are poorly encoded but the rest of the package is so strong that it manages to overcome these flaws and in the end, Nier Automata is a gem of a game and one of my favorites of the year. Cuphead is perhaps the most unexpected inclusion on this list. Since its first public unveiling, I've never doubted for a moment that Cuphead would look incredible. With its carefully hand-painted artwork and fluid animation, there really isn't anything else out there which looks quite like this. But I naively assumed that this would be a game focused on visuals alone and expected its gameplay to fall short of the classics which inspired it. Clearly, this was one of those games that would be sold by visuals alone, right? Oh, how wrong I was. Cuphead is a fantastic game, and it's clear that the designers absolutely understand what it is that makes classics like Alien Soldier and Gunstar Heroes stand the test of time. Cuphead's basic mechanics are focused primarily on shooting and dodging. You can basically jump, dash, duck, and parry while unleashing a basic attack or a series of specials. Crucially, each action is simple to execute in terms of button presses, and within a short time, players should have a full mastery of the basic concepts. Nailing the controls is an important first step in a game like this, and Cuphead absolutely delivers. At the core of its design then, Cuphead is a game about learning and reacting to a series of challenges, and it's this gradual learning process that makes for such a rewarding experience. Across its run of play, Cuphead presents a series of boss fights with a handful of running gun stages framed within a beautiful overworld, and it's these boss fights which are the primary focus here. They appear overwhelming at first, sure, but ultimately present a series of predictable and learnable patterns to contend with. And like any good shooter, prior to any attack, the boss telegraphs its attack, allowing players to prepare for the impending assault. Bullet and enemy patterns can be simple as a straight line to something more like this. 
The run and gun stages then function similarly, but combine enemy patterns with additional navigational and platform challenges. So that's the basic rundown, right? But what makes it so fun? Well, it's the quality of the execution here combined with the satisfaction of learning it. With so many challenges to overcome, you are constantly rewarded. This isn't a game about receiving loot or leveling up your character though, which ultimately feels like a shallow reward to me. Instead, Cuphead rewards the player with knowledge and eventual success while keeping things constrained. It can be a challenging game, but the scope of the challenge is always very immediate. It's a series of small challenges and overcoming each one feels great. The combination of highly responsive controls and the joy from learning and overcoming a series of micro-challenges makes for a memorable time. The core is solid then, but what elevates Cuphead to the next level is the presentation, and I believe this is the key in defining the very best games. When you combine satisfying and responsive gameplay with gorgeous visuals and a killer soundtrack, you're left with something that will stick with you. The gameplay supports the visuals, which supports the soundtrack, and the combination of these three elements helps make Cuphead one of my favorites of the year. It's the perfect example of easy to learn, difficult to master, but always entertaining. I always expected to enjoy Super Mario Odyssey, but never expected it to surprise me quite like this. Now, I'm a huge fan of Mario games, of course. I mean, Super Mario World is one of my all-time favorite games, after all, and it's a series which Nintendo gets right time and time again, but Super Mario Odyssey is a little different. Now, this is effectively a proper follow-up to the seminal Super Mario 64, a game which helped define what a 3D platformer could be at a time when nobody really knew how to pull it off, and Super Mario Odyssey does expand upon these concepts in some interesting ways. Firstly, there's the ability to possess enemies now, which allows for new challenges and navigational opportunities that were previously impossible. The worlds themselves also offer a visual diversity with some bold designs and concepts which kind of run counter to classic Mario. But what makes this whole experience so unique is the untidiness of it all. Now, that sounds weird, but Mario games are traditionally somewhat buttoned up, so to speak. Sure, Mario Galaxy pushes the limits of this, but even then, it was very coherent and specific in a lot of ways. Mario Odyssey, though, presents this wild collection of moments and worlds and ideas that just kind of fit together in this weird, jumbled, haphazard way. Is that really a good thing, though? Well, in this case, it kind of is. It's a lot of fun. Now, ultimately, your objective boils down to collecting moons. Some are easy to find, some are a lot more difficult, but that's kind of the driving force. But it's what you can do after you find these moons and the paths that it leads you on while finding them that makes this so interesting. There always feel like there's something new to discover, some corner of the map that you've not seen before, and that kind of pushes you to keep exploring. And on top of that, there's this wildly variable pacing to it all with an unexpected presentation that really sticks with me. Something as simple as this, that moment when you first arrive in New Donk City under the cover of a thunderstorm, it's really weirdly atmospheric and memorable, and it's something you don't really see in most Mario games. And the New Donk City Festival is a great example of this as well. The gameplay presented in this sequence is fun, but ultimately very simple, but what sets it apart is the incredible fusion of music and art design. Spin the wheel, take a chance, every journey starts with new romance. With a full vocal backing track, tons of animation, gorgeous color choices, and simple but fun platforming, it's just this euphoric moment that really sticks with you, and it's not the only one. It's rare to see Nintendo lean so heavily into the presentation to create such a situation, and I love it. This ebb and flow between emotional highs and more subdued, relaxed sequences just really works. It's a weird little game overall, but it's one that I had an absolute blast playing, hence why it's number three. Prey feels like a game which came and went without a lot of fanfare, but if you give it a chance, there's a spectacular gem hidden within. Prey belongs to a subgenre of games which aren't really defined by a name. 
Some call them immersive sims, but ultimately I believe that these are games which follow in the footsteps of the great Looking Glass studios of the 90s. This includes classics like System Shock, Deus Ex, and Vampire the Masquerade Redemption. Games in this style typically provide expansive yet dense worlds to explore, a steep challenge with a multitude of possible solutions to success, a rich atmosphere, and an engaging story. And Prey easily stands among the greats. Prey takes place aboard Talos 1, an enormous space laboratory packed with interesting sights and vicious enemies perfect for exploration. And in more ways than one, it kind of feels like a proper shock game, something along the lines of System Shock 2 more than anything else. Beyond the space setting, its key systems are more complex and interesting than something like Bioshock, and the challenge is steep. And I believe that this challenge is one of the key elements which allows the game to shine. It feels like the antithesis of a modern open world game in that you get to know every inch of the map through necessity rather than simply running across it. After all, enemies and prey are dangerous and resources are extremely limited, so it's really not always possible to simply run around the station freely. And this helps encourage you to explore every nook and cranny of each level, looking for supplies which, in turn, helps you learn the map and appreciate its finer details. It becomes a world which you are intimately familiar with, as you start to piece together the history of its crew and the circumstances of what happened on the station, it all begins to gel nicely. Along the way, you have access to a wide variety of weapons and tools, but it's not always possible to dispatch enemies in a traditional fashion. Sometimes you'll set up a perimeter using other tools, maybe use the ship's built-in systems, the glue gun, or simply run. There's moments of stealth, moments of action, and sometimes just tranquil exploration. It's this wide range of gameplay opportunities, overall challenge level, and impeccable atmosphere which help Prey stand out. It feels relatively freeform, with things like the glue gun, but it's ultimately constrained in a way that helps keep things focused. Every inch of the game world feels carefully crafted, and all of this is backed by a lovely visual aesthetic and a killer soundtrack from Mick Gordon. Now, it is true that the game did launch with some issues, including input lag on the PS4, some performance hiccups, lack of PS4 Pro support, not to mention the removal of direct input on the PC version, which breaks controller support requiring mods to fix. But even in the face of these issues, Prey is a top tier experience. This is the type of gaming that I live for and it's helped cement Arcane Studios as one of my favorite developers in the business today. It's not clear what the future holds for Arcane, but for the time being, this is Looking Glass Studios for a new generation. Now we've arrived, it's Sonic Mania time! It's difficult to convey just how much I love this game. Sonic Mania is something I've waited for for decades and truly believed would never be achieved, but here we are. The original 16-bit Sonic games are classics in my book, some of my favorite platformers of all time, but the series has had a rough time beyond 1994, at least until this year. Sonic Mania is something special then, a game crafted by passionate fans turned developers that spent years understanding what made Sonic great in the first place, and then pushing beyond it. This is the natural evolution of 16-bit platforming, and so much more. At its core are the mechanics then, Sonic was designed with a focus on momentum and speed management. It's not about instantly speeding up or stopping on a dime or just holding right, it's about mastering the granular movement and going with the flow of the stage. Learning these mechanics and making your way through a level without taking a hit is remarkably rewarding, and Sonic Mania perfectly captures this. The level design is top-notch as well. Sonic Mania subscribes to the same formula featured in the Mega Drive games with upper, middle, and lower tier designs, along with lots of unique gadgets along the way. The stages are massive, beautiful, and well thought out. There are four original stages here and they're all great, but what's most surprising is the twist on the existing stages. While many of them are based on classic 16-bit levels, the layouts are totally new and the second act in any stage massively amps up the features of the stage, leading to lots of surprises. Then there's the music. T. Lopes takes the reins this time with a soundtrack channeling the stylings of Sonic CD with his own unique spin. 
Each track is beautifully crafted and perfectly suited to the associated level. Music is so important in a platform game and plays a huge role in driving the action here, and the soundtrack is one of the best I've ever heard in a platform game. Really, I could go on and on here. I mean, the visuals and art direction, for instance, are beautifully designed. We've seen so many games take advantage of the 8-bit aesthetic, but Sonic Mania goes straight for the Sega Saturn era of 2D graphics. Expressive sprites, impressive parallax backgrounds, rich tile design, gorgeous 3D stages, it's all here and it's all top-notch. Really, what pushes Sonic Mania to the top for me, though, comes down to how I feel while playing it. The mix of high-speed action, beautiful visuals, a killer soundtrack, perfect controls, easter eggs galore, tons of stages and surprises around every corner is just too potent. More than any other game I've played this year, Sonic Mania brought a smile to my face each and every time. It's pure bliss. In many ways, this is platforming perfected. Along with Super Mario World, I've long considered Sonic the Hedgehog 2 to be one of the best platform games ever made, and Sonic Mania is every bit as good if not better. What the development team has achieved here with Sonic Mania is just unbelievable, and I certainly hope that Sega is ready to give them anything they need to keep on creating. This is the new Sonic Team. So what do you guys think? It's not a list I'd imagine everyone will agree with, but that's just the nature of these things. For me, it's great to go back and revisit the games which made the greatest impact this year, and there's a lot more than this. Other games I consider for the top 5 include things like Zelda Breath of the Wild, Horizon, Dragon Quest XI, Resident Evil 7, Neo, and others. No matter which games you enjoyed though, 2017 was one heck of a year, that much is for certain. But that's all for now though, if you enjoyed this video be sure to let us know in the comments, subscribe to our channel, and follow us over on Twitter. And until next year, this is John signing off.